losing uh, for him was uh, uh, already uh, bad, <laughs> and losing against me was really uh, the worst thing he could uh, he could have. For him, be second, he was the first of the losers. He just hated that. It, it was nothing for him but winning. He just want to psych his opposition that they all think that Senna was in front of them. He had to be quickest all the time. Ayrton would enter a corner faster than he'd ever been before and trust that something inside Ayrton Senna would help get him and the car around the corner. And that's an act of trust or faith or whatever you want to call it. He prepared his chance, but when it was there, he took it. And when you want to correct it, no way. That, that was uh, aggression. No? So in the end of the day, when you saw the yellow helmet, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> I always thought that he was just too intense about winning. And he actually believed that he had a God-given right to win. limit as soon you touch this limit something happens and you suddenly can go a little bit further with your mind power your determination your instinct and the experience as well you can fly very high Ayrton Senna's talent commitment and determination carried him beyond normal boundaries he displayed a supreme ability behind the wheel of a racing car, but he also demonstrated an immense depth of character, of thought and of emotion. His tremendous rivalry with Alain Prost throughout the late 80s and early 90s extracted every element of his genius. But if there was one area where Senna truly flew high, it was racing in the rain. His precision in the wet, he was just unbelievable. He just filled the car so much more. In the, in the wet, you have to be very precise. You cannot make any um, jatter with the steering or be, uh, you've got to be much more gently with it. And, and Ayrton filled the car much more than any other driver. First of all, looking out of my commentary box window, I saw the worst weather that I have ever seen at any race anywhere in the world. And it was rather embarrassing to me as an Englishman that everybody who thinks that it always rains the whole time in England <laughs> was, was getting their suspicions proved. Ayrton was always very, very fast when it was wet. And uh, this day we had uh, a little bit everything for him and a little bit everything against, against us to look stupid. <laughs> we employed somebody for the weather forecast, you know, and he was in, uh, at the airport uh, close to the track at Dunnington, and we were in uh, permanent contact with him, you know. So we started the rest and, uh, and then uh, he was uh, saying to us, I mean, not to me, not to, to the engineers, that, uh, you know, we had a shower, <laughs> and a big shower, so we had a few spots, and then I stopped for the, for the tires, and then we had just a few stops, and, and then dry, you know? And then every time he was saying something, it was the opposite. And I had uh, the sad record of uh, seven times changing tires, but uh, six times in the wrong way anyway, you know? He was already pissed off anyway all the year about to having this engine uh, this fourth engine in his McLaren because he wants to fight for the championship and uh, through the numbers he know that he's not going to fight for the championship. So all what he could do is to, to wait for a special circumstance and then to show everybody again what he, what he can do. And that was a special circumstance. And all what he want to do, he puts in his head in the first lap, he's going to come back first, you know, because he's going to look, make look everybody stupid. And that's exactly what he did. 
It was making me hold my breath. <laughs> and they were having a job to get my breath at the best of times. You just thought, well, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. It can't stay like this. It's bound to go off. And there he did, kept going and going and going. Nobody knew where anybody was. I remember the spray as he went. <laughs> when everyone else was cautiously going around thinking, ooh, I better be careful, he just went, go. And um, he was off. Gone. <laughs> he was brilliant, uh, but he knew he could do that. I was here, and it's the other end of the pitch to give the trophy away, and I should have still been in hospital till the following Tuesday with heart problem I had. But when I got onto the podium, you'd forgot all about you were ill. You felt 18 years of age to see the happy face he'd got. It was unbelievable. His roots were firmly grounded in the sprawling steel-making city of Sao Paulo, the industrial heartland of Brazil. Here, amid the energy and bustle of South American commerce, Ayrton developed his talents on the cart track at Interlagos and began a collection of trophies that would become greatly cherished by his close-knit family. O Ayrton sempre foi uma pessoa extremamente determinada. Ele sabia exatamente o que ele queria e ele ia atrás daquilo até conseguir. Ele era extremamente persistente. Quando ele era pequeno, a gente chamava ele de teimoso, porque ele ia assim até o fim aonde ele queria chegar. De criança, eu lembro muito é, a época que ele corria, de que ele treinava de kart, da época que ele, inclusive, foi viajar para fora e nas vezes que ele fez para fora para correr em campeonatos de kart, ele eram viagens rápidas, mas que é, sempre tinha uma expectativa muito grande de que resultado que ele ia obter e, e sempre ele teve, cada ano ele tinha resultados muito positivos, então as minhas recordações são muito ligadas a isso, porque a vida dele era muito, muito ligada a, 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 ao, ao automobilismo. Desde, desde que eu nasci, desde que eu me lembro, ele já andava de kart quando eu nasci. Before long, kart races in Brazil and all around the world became all too aware of the driver in the yellow helmet. O Ayrton, eu conheci ele quando ele era um garoto de kart, ele, ele era piloto de kart. Mas na época eu já pintava para o Emerson Fittipaldi, que era bicampeão mundial de Fórmula 1, para o Nelson Piquet, que já estava na Fórmula 1, então ele queria é, criar a sua identidade também. Então eu resolvi, pensando em, em colocar uma cor quente no capacete, como a Ferrari, que é vermelha, pintei ele de amarelo, certo? Com duas faixas saindo em verde e azul, saindo como se fossem os olhos dele, porque dá movimento e da agressividade também. Então assim foi feito e, e foi composto as cores do país, em verde, amarelo, azul e branco. Quando Ayrton retornou, ele quis adotar essa pintura que ficou para sempre a pintura dele. Foi isso aí. I know him since a uh, long long time ago because uh, we did two world karting championship together in Le Mans and Estoril 78 and 79. So this goes back to the very very old days and um, he was very, very committed. He had this, uh, you know, this star, these eyes. He was exceptionally committed, I think, more than anybody else. A gente sempre foi uma família super unida e quando Ayrton eh, foi morar na Inglaterra, todos nós eh, sentimos muito, e ele também, né, a falta, a distância. Então, a gente uh, muitas vezes ia para lá ou quando ele podia vir para poder ter essa essa proximidade maior ele escrevia muito cada corrida que ele fazia ele escrevia detalhando cada curva cada coisa que ele tinha feito a gente tem essas cartas até hoje e mesmo a distância o contato sempre foi muito muito próximo Como o Ayrton, quando foi para lá, ele não sabia inglês, então ele ficava 
frente da tele, em frente da televisão horas e horas tentando entender o que estava se passando, procurando aprender a língua e se concentrando. Ele também não sabia cozinhar, nunca soube e, e na verdade ele passou alguns anos comendo ovo frito, ovo cozido, ovo mexido, todos os tipos de ovos possíveis e imagináveis porque era o que ele conseguia fazer. Quando o Ait me procurou em 1984, em janeiro, é, ele tinha muita preocupação com o preparo físico, com a sua saúde, porque ele era muito magro, uma pessoa realmente fraca, e era até chamado Franzino Ayrton Senna, pela mídia. Nós iniciamos o um trabalho, percebemos a vontade é, férrea que ele tinha de buscar é, ser mais forte, mais resistente, era uma pessoa que tinha uma força interior muito grande, porque ele não media esforços. Se alguém perguntar qual a diferença do Ayrton, é esse fazer. Porque saber de cabeça é não saber nada. E eu falava muito para ele isso. Ayrton, o sábio não é o que sabe. O sábio é o que faz aquilo que sabe. It is not simply a, a stronger muscle or a better tonus in your muscle, but it's really the power, the strength you get physically speaking, you know, to your body, but also to your mind. And uh, you only really learn by doing it, I believe. Once I realized that there was something special in there, I really focus and try to learn about myself because it's basically learning about yourself, learning about your own limitations, learning about your strengths, your qualities, and trying to, to make as a whole uh, a smoother person. I don't remember exactly, but certainly in 1983, um, I was very much aware of him in Former 3 in England, and he was very persistent, A, about winning, he was very good at that, uh, already that early in his career, but uh, very persistent about trying to persuade Patrick and myself to let him test of his first drive in a Grand Prix car in a Formula 1 car. That first drive came at Donington Park in England, at the wheel of the Williams FW08C, the model of car that had taken Keki Rosberg to victory in Monaco earlier the same year. Ayrton turned up, made himself comfortable in the cockpit, remembered all the instructions about what everything was for in the cockpit. <laughs> At the time, he was only halfway through his first season of Formula 3, but he was totally undaunted by the Grand Prix car with triple the power of his usual mount. I set off, did an out, and what we call an out and a straight back in lap to check over the car mechanically. And then over the next 21 laps, I think it was, he just went off a second quicker than the car had ever been around there. And then said, I think that's all, that's, that's all right, I've got enough in my head, got out of the car and went home. So we were quite astonished. In that particular day, it was obvious that his brain was in total control of everything else, it was just ahead of the game, clearly belonged in a Grand Prix car. He was born for that, if you like. We weren't ready to put him in the team in 84, uh, partly for, well, for contractual obligations to other drivers. And then he went off to Lotus and then to McLaren. So it was quite a long while before we were able to offer him a seat which was for 94. When he went to Tolman it was fantastic to see another Brazilian uh, driving. Um, uh, um, I mean by instinct I was always more of a fan of, of, of Ayrton than I, I, I had with uh, any other uh, Brazilian Formula One. I, I never had the chance to see Emerson but I had the chance to see Nelson. With Ayrton it was different. I, I felt like uh, you know, he was driving tremendously and uh, he was going to be a champ. I remember we had a discussion about uh, top drivers like uh, Nelson Piquet or whatever. 
And uh, I said to, to Ron and even all the people, said, take the best young guy coming, you know, to, to get a very strong team is Ayrton. They all said, why you want, you want to have Ayrton? You know? I said, yeah, why not? You know, I mean, it's thinking about the team. So having a teammate like Ayrton was very, very different to the all the teammates I had, you know. And uh, also for Formula One, it uh, was really exceptional to have uh, uh, two drivers of this same uh, caliber. When Ayrton came into Formula One, Alain Prost was the top. He was number one, and he was the one that he wanted to catch. He wanted to beat him. And uh, when he started testing with us, and racing with us, he was not interested in anybody else in the, in the grid, you know, just Alain, what time did he do? What tires is he using? What rear wing has he got? What springs has he got? He just wanted to know what Alain was doing, and that's the one he wanted to, to beat. He was a man like no other man I had ever met before. He was um, almost a mystic. He was very, very, very intense. Uh, he was a charismatic personality. He could be absolutely charming, but there was another side to his character. He was absolutely ruthless when he was in the cockpit. Um, and he was an intensely religious, God-fearing man. And he actually believed that he had a God-given right to win. The main thing is to be yourself and not allow people to disturb you, to be different because they want you to be different. You gotta be yourself. Many times it's through a mistake due to your own personality or your own, your own character or interference that you get on the way that you learn. And the main thing is to make sure you learn through your mistakes and get better. I believe in the ability of focusing strongly in something, then you're able to extract even more out of it. His whole life was concentration for the, for the race or for the championship. He had no family, no children, nothing, you know, so it looks like he was living only for, for that. Eh, ma durante le corse la cosa più difficile è quella di tenere la concentrazione, essere sempre concentrati, di non avere eh, problemi che possono eh, eh, distorgere l'attenzione ai, ai problemi reali della corsa, essere preparato tecnicamente e sapere cosa fare nel momento migliore e non fare errori né dal punto di vista tecnico né dal punto di vista umano. In the time of, uh the very sophisticated racing cars we had, with skirts and electronic suspension and all that, what you have to have, put the car up on the straights and then lower down before the corner. You have to do so many things on the car. But, eh, ovviamente, qualsiasi pilota che partecipa ad una manifestazione sportiva automobilistica, a prescindere che sia Formula 1 o altre categorie, è esposta a dei rischi. Eh, questi rischi sono considerati. Nessuno corre senza utilizzare la testa perché un pilota senza la testa non ha futuro. Eh, un pilota senza la testa eh, ha una carriera molto breve perché farà molti incidenti e si farà sicuramente male. Quindi questa è una categoria dove serve essere veloci, performanti, costanti e intelligenti. As a racing driver, one has to be in tune with your emotions, your, your body, your, your mind, your psychology, all these things. So I think Ayrton had those qualities in, in, in abundance. And, um, and he was questioning, he seemed like a driver was constantly question, questioning what, he was, what it was to be a racing driver. Once he got into the concentrate, he didn't feel anymore any pain, he didn't feel anymore any stress, he didn't feel anymore, he was just in another world. As we all been a kind of, but his one, he, he was more intensive, he was a step ahead. There's a state of mind that one is raised to, where it becomes sort of transcendental, um, 
and Ayrton spoke about things, things to do with his concentration when he was in qualifying. He talked about a state of mind that he got into whereby he was there but not really driving the car. And, and these are things that are, are um, speak of his level of concentration that he, that he achieved as a racing driver. You had to do this famous qualifying laps. It was something where you, you was in the box, you watched still the monitor, you watched your competitors, you had to talk with your engineer, how is, how is the wind, how is the sun, how is the asphalt temperature. And then suddenly the engineer told you, now let's go. That let's go means you had to switch a, a button and to say, okay, and now I have to be fully concentrated and actually getting into another world where everything start to go in slow motion because when you do a quick lap, you try to, to, to see everything in slow motion to do the, all the fine things right. And, uh, and it's a kind of a dream. Everyone who followed Formula One recognized that Senna was the master of qualifying. If you go for a, a, a corner on qualifying tires with extra horsepower and you've never you've never had that all weekend how do you anticipate how fast you can go how do we know how fast the car is capable so Ayrton would enter a corner faster than he'd ever been before and trust that something inside Ayrton Senna would help get him and the car around the corner and that's an act of that's an act of trust or faith or whatever you, whatever you want to call it he explored his ultimate capabilities more than any, than any driver seems to have done. The thing with him, he was such a good driver that he used to adapt to the car when he couldn't make the car going quicker. You know, he could make quicker a wheelbarrow, whatever you give him in his hands, he could make it quicker because he then he changed the car and he didn't get it to his liking. Then um, he adapted to the car. Uh, how many times you have a car that is perfect how you like it when you have a car that is perfect a line was unbeatable a line pros was really good when the car was suited him but it suited him just a few times not always i was doing all the tests and uh, in winter i was not testing i was doing all the tests for him and uh, and to set up the car i don't think he was the best the best uh, driver but uh, driving uh, mentally and uh, getting the pole and uh, being quick on one lap and uh, it was really really the best you know so i don't think i learned very much because uh, uh, it's a little bit easier to learn about uh, the car <laughs> and uh, the way you can improve the car than uh, than the mental way because you cannot change your mental just like this when you decide it you know <laughs> Fórmula 1 tem uma exigência absurda. Não sei se você sabe, uh, o piloto tem uma frequência média de 180 batimentos por minuto. É uma loucura, com picos de 220, 230. E apesar de estar num carro aberto, o calor é muito grande. Então a exigência do piloto é completamente diferente de qualquer esporte. É muito estressante. Havia sofrimento, claro. Trabalhávamos a, a uma hora da tarde, que é o horário de verão, para pegar o maior calor. Porque para o aí que interessava, lá na Fórmula 1, quando a competição era extremamente desgastante. Quanto pior, melhor. Por quê? Porque ele estava muito mais preparado do que as outras pessoas, do que os outros pilotos, que na época não se dedicavam ao trabalho com o corpo, com a mente, com as emoções, com o espírito. Por isso, é, ele se tornou imbatível. Eu lembro quando começamos com a meditação, ele tinha uma dificuldade muito grande de não pensar, tinha assim uma, é, achava terrivelmente difícil fazer isso. No entanto, ele se envolveu tanto com esse processo de meditação, que ele conseguiu momentos de uma profundidade mental tão eloquente, 
que atingia níveis inigualáveis de profundidade, que ajudava muito nas tomadas de tempo, ajudava muito nos seus recordes, nas suas vitórias, porque a concentração dele era máxima devido a esse trabalho de meditação, de respiração, de relaxamento. Monaco era um lugar especial para Senna. He shot to fame by nearly winning the race in his debut season and would go on to take victory in the Principality a record six times. On his first outing in a McLaren, however, Prost thought he had him on the ropes. In Monaco, where he was not very good into the weekend, was uh, the first Thursday was uh, ahead of him and uh, Saturday, almost the whole day, I was ahead of him until the last qualifying lap, <laughs> where just like this, and he went quick and uh, he, he get the pole for just a little bit but I was really was I could not imagine that he could come back just like this because he was not going going that well and he said in a press conference that uh, he, he find uh, he, he went outside the car <laughs> and he look at the car how the car was behaving on the track and then realizing what he was doing wrong and uh, what was wrong, came back in the car and drove at the perfection, you know, in a perfect lap. For me, it was very difficult to hear that, you know. In fact, it looks like everybody needed a, a guy like, like that, you know. He was different. <laughs> I was too boring, you know, <laughs> and he was different. Once you in it, you in it, and you've got to go all the way to the end. Because you commit yourself to such a level, where there is no compromise. You give everything you have, everything, absolutely everything. And sometimes you find even more because it requires more if you want still to be ahead, if you want to win. The uncanny will to win that he had, I've never seen it in any other sportsman. Or I certainly haven't been connected to anybody that had that fear, determination to succeed and to win. It was just, like Alan Prost said, for, for Ayrton, he is willing to risk that little bit more than any one of us will do. And, and maybe, you know, for him, be second, he was the first of the losers. He just hated that. It, it was nothing for him but winning. Losing uh, for him was uh, uh, already uh, bad. <laughs> And losing against me was really uh, the worst thing he could uh, he could have, and that's why the all his all motivation was to beat me. And I can remember we went to the Bercy karting event, and he was there um, watching on the big screen Alan Prost driving in the cart, and he never he never took his eyes off that, and he watched Alan Prost driving a go kart. He knew that to be world champion, he had to beat a line, because he was number one at the, at the time. I remember one race, and I think it was the Belgium Grand Prix. Ayrton always used to try so hard in qualifying that after qualifying, he just to, before he took his overalls, he sit in the corner of the track and he just uh, gets all his adrenaline back. Alain and I were looking at the times, and he just Alain could say, "I just can't believe how he could be so quick. Where is he beating me?" Every, anywhere else, but here, I always quake here, how he can be. And then as I look at Ayrton, Ayrton was sitting up in can and he looked at, look at me and he winked an eye. And I thought that he just felt so satisfied I had beat the line and he had recognized that I'm quicker than him. And he was so, for him, that was point of a stage in his career. He thought, well, I can now begin to think of being world champion. When Ayrton came along in his footsteps, he was, his approach was in many ways similar. It was cerebral. That means he used his head at all times. But um, there was, he did so with more, with more dash and determination than you ever saw in Alan. Alan had plenty of determination. He, just never, he never exposed it. Ayrton, it was all about drive and courage and let's go for it. We'll just leave the, leave the rest to me when he was in the car. Formula One drive, all sportsmen are gigantically competitive they're there to win and you've got you've got two very different people in Alain Prost the professor who was quiet very quiet he always spoke very quietly indeed 
uh, very, very smooth, very experienced, up against Senna from South America with a very different temperament. Uh, and so it could not have been better from a journalist's point of view or a commentator's point of view. The fact that we were fighting so hard together, we were putting the level of, I mean, the performance of the car and the team at a very high level. And uh, if you're talking about the briefings, we were spending, yeah, three, four, five hours into the briefing. It was for two reasons. The first reason is to improve the car and the team. And the second reason is to be sure that we, we could not forget something that could suit us or suit me, for example, better than Ayrton, or Ayrton would think of something suit me better than Alan, you know? At the end, it, it, it could also become a, a, a psychology. If you have a briefing, you know, there's no way that I could go out of the briefing before Ayrton. And Ayrton could not go out of the briefing before me anyway. <laughs> You know, so we were going out together. I waited for four and a half hours outside the motorhome while they were having this minute discussion about this and that. And then the door opened and Alain Prost came out. And he came down the steps and I said, Alain, in God's name, what do you talk about in there for four and a half hours? And he said, oh, Murray, he said, uh, this and that, but I do not like to be the first to leave. The intense nature of the battle between the two McLaren teammates led to a deterioration in their personal relationship. Other teams and drivers were simply not at the same level, so Senna and Prost focused on one another, both in and out of the car. But that was part of the fight we had anyway. Everything was tough on the track, outside the track, setting up the car, all, all kind of things was really just at the limit all the time. You know? We also knew that uh, if we were quick and fast and a winning car, that was also because of, uh, because of us, because of the drivers, because we were dominating, you know, Formula One. It's not pretentious to say that. I think that Ayrton and Alain were people who needed a lot of the other. Because for them to be able to develop their own potentials in the top, in the most perfect way, the other competition helped to get to the maximum development. I think Ayrton would not be what he was without Alain Prost. I think Ayrton would not be what he was without Alain Prost. E vice-versa. Acho que o Alain não, pode, não teria sido o que ele foi sem o Ayrton Senna. Uma vez perguntaram para o Ayrton se ele tinha inimigos. E eu acho que o Ayrton respondeu uma das coisas mais lindas que ele respondeu em todas as suas muitas entrevistas. Ele disse que a vida era muito curta para se ter inimigos. Então, eu acho que, às vezes, a vida é mais curta ainda do que a gente pensa, como aconteceu com ele. Eu acho que essa frase é perfeita, seja no momento que ele e o Alain eram inimigos, né? Ou depois, que nem eram, mas para qualquer condição como essa, eu acho que essa frase é perfeita. Quando você está sob muita pressão, em um momento momento, em uma championship ou em uma particular race, it's the one that can put together the combination between aggressivity and calculating things that will get the best result. And you need more than anything a very clear mind to understand exactly when is the moment to be aggressive, when is the moment to be calculated. To win a championship you need the combination of those elements in the right doses at given moments. The lifestyle enjoyed by Ayrton was that of the rich and famous. Beautiful houses, lots of toys, and opportunities to relax. But his love of Brazil and for its people was reflected in the way they felt about him. He was idolized by the ordinary men and women in the street, and he's still idolized today. Massimo, pessoa extraordinária, maravilhosa. Foi embora muito cedo. 
certo. Vagabundo, meu, é ele. Oh, esse pra nós aqui é o, é o melhor do mundo. Muito legal, muita saudade dele. Faz muita falta pro esporte brasileiro. Ele representava muita alegria, né? Ao domingo. Tinha muita emoção lá, na grande corrida dele. Grande piloto, tem muita alegria pra nós no Brasil. É difícil ter um. Tem outro piloto igual o. Ai, que beleza! A pessoa representa tudo para o nosso país. Foi o maior ídolo, a maior glória, foi tudo. Acho que para todos os brasileiros nós é a honra de ter uma foto dessa aqui, observar assim e ter como lembrança. Né? Ele é, um... para mim, ele foi um dos melhores brasileiros do mundo e ele deve ser homenageado por todos, porque eu acho que ele foi o melhor, mesmo que ele já tenha ido. Isso aqui, isso aqui representou para a gente os melhores fins de semana aqui do Brasil. É pra mim um ótimo atleta, uma ótima pessoa, um ótimo ser humano e um exemplo de vida. Deu até um, um, um nó na garganta quando olhei. Isso pra mim significa muito, viu? Muita saudade. Despite the access that Ayrton had to his own slice of paradise, he was always aware that there were many Brazilians who battled not for world championships, but simply to put food on the table and keep a roof overhead. And it mattered to him more than many people knew. I think that was the second year when I was in Brazil with him. And we were going through with these favelas. You can see the favelas. You see this poverty on the other side. And you work with someone who has his own plane and has everything and so on. How is that? Do you have no problem? How does it go when you see this? Dann, da habe ich gemerkt, jetzt, jetzt sind wir auf einem anderen äh, Punkt dieser Unterhaltung. Oder? Und er hat gesagt, Josef, mich stört das total, diese Korruption, diese Schwierigkeiten, diese Leute. Mich, äh, ich habe ein, ein, wirklich eine, eine Wut oder eine Trauer, wenn ich sehe, wie diese Leute leiden. Oder? Aber ich bin noch nicht stark genug, ich bin noch nicht mächtig genug, dass ich was ändern kann. Oder? Und da hat, hat sich gezeigt, in welcher Richtung dieser Mann eigentlich gehen will. Oder? Dieses Reinfahren. Dieses schnell zu fahren, dieses an das Limit zu gehen, ist einfach nur ein, eine Brücke oder ein Wagen, ein Fahrzeug gewesen, um in diese Richtung, wo er hinkommen wollte, ist. Das ist auch ein Prozess von ihm selber gewesen, wahrscheinlich, oder? I think the best remembrance I had was when I stayed with him that weekend in his house, in his farm, and we had a storm, and the lights and the telephone went out of order, and I needed to phone my wife, who was in. Scotland. So we went out and we found a telephone box. So I, I phoned my wife and he went outside. It was dark and he was standing under a light, a street lamp, and s some kids had seen him and recognized him. And by then he had 20 or 30 children around him and he was chatting to them and signing their autographs, signing their autographs for them. And when I came out of the telephone box, that's the, one of the sweetest memories I have of him, standing with the light playing on his head and shoulders and surrounded by the kids and being so nice to them. Dois meses antes do acidente, o Ayrton me procurou e disse que ele gostaria de fazer alguma coisa para ajudar crianças e jovens e me pediu para pensar a respeito e a gente voltaria a conversar. Só que essa segunda conversa não pôde acontecer, porque logo depois, dois meses após isso, já aconteceu o acidente e então minha família e eu decidimos levar adiante essa ideia e plantar essa semente que o Ayrton deixou e foi assim que nasceu o Instituto Ayrton Senna dividir, compartilhar uma, uma coisa que ele teve a chance de ter, mas que a maioria das crianças brasileiras não teve, que se chama oportunidade. Oportunidade de ter educação, de ter saúde, de ter futuro e, e esperança. Ayrton stand out amongst Grand Prix drivers was that he knew there was something outside Formula One. And I think he made that his mission in Formula One to 
build himself a platform so that he could express how he felt about things to do with humanity, things to do with people. And um, maybe his approach within Formula One was ruthless sometimes, <laughs> maybe not humanitarian even. But there's no question that what he felt um, was, a, was a deep empathy with, with mankind and, and with uh, the, the problems in the world. We are made of emotions. We are all looking for emotions, basically. It's only a question of finding the way to, to experience them. There are many different ways of experiencing emotions. Perhaps one different thing only that, one particular thing that Formula One can provide you is that you know you are always exposed to danger. Danger of getting hurt, danger of dying. Travel was a major factor in Senna's life. To ease the strain, he acquired his own aircraft and employed the services of a private pilot. Over a period of four and a half years, Owen Omani got to know his employer extremely well. Very often we used to go backwards and forwards to Brazil and we'd leave Sao Paulo at 10.30 at night and Ayrton would lay out the bed at the back of the aircraft, go to sleep in his pyjamas and we'd shut the door. And then first thing, seven o'clock in the morning, I used to come back to the cabin, wake Ayrton up, and we'd be landing in England at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. He'd be as fresh as a daisy, and of course, we were totally shattered. My compliment to him is to say that he was big enough to be little, if you understand what I'm saying. In April 1994, Owen flew Senna to the Imola circuit for the San Marino Grand Prix. Eh, a Imola, Ayrton si è sempre trovato in maniera particolare come sul circuito di casa. Da allora, dopo l'84, Ayrton Senna ha conquistato 8 pole position in 10 anni. Ha cominciato con le Lotus e poi con la serie incredibile con McLaren per finire con Williams e anche l'ultimo anno in cui lui e corse a Imola era chiaramente in pole position. Lui era solito eh, scendere non a Imola città, ma soggiornava a Castel San Pietro dove c'era un, uh, un albergo che faceva che gli piaceva particolarmente, aveva la pista per l'atterraggio dell'elicottero, era particolarmente chiaro. Era l'hotel Castello dove lui e la sua squadra risiedevano. Era una persona comunque molto, molto semplice, ehm, dolce e soprattutto eh, riservato. E infatti chiedeva spesso di mangiare qui da noi nel ristorante, però voleva magari l'ultimo tavolo, quello più nascosto, più diciamo lontano dal, da, dalle persone. The whole weekend was uh, terrible. I mean, when first of all had the accident of uh, Ruben Barrichello, then the day after Roland Ratzenberg um, and Ayrton only met him the day before, because he was his first Grand Prix. And he was very deep, very upset about it. The team manager for Ratzenberger arrived, so I had to tell uh, the team manager what had happened, and Senna was standing alongside me when I did that. And the team manager went away, and then Ayrton got very, very upset and cried a bit. and. Uh, And that's when I said to him, you know, Ayrton, you, you've been three times world champion, you're the fastest man in the world, and uh, you like fishing. So I said, why don't you quit, and I'll quit, and we just go fishing. So when you asked him a difficult question, he wouldn't answer immediately. He would think, and he could see his thinking, and how was he going to deal with that suggestion. And then finally he said, Sid, uh, I can't quit. 
and I suggested to him that he didn't drive the rest of that weekend and he said and I've got to drive I've got to drive tomorrow uh, he said uh, there's no way that that I can stop driving at the moment in the morning, when we had this uh, TV coverage, so I was doing the, the, my, my job, and then we look at the commentary of Ayrton, and the first thing he says is not, OK, I take this corner in first gear, second gear. He said, uh, uh, this first uh, hello to Alain. Uh, Alain, we, uh, I miss you. Uh, and and uh, I was really, you know, on live, and they put that in the morning, they put that before the rest. I mean, again, you know, I mean, people so... At the end, it was like a, a sort of uh, all the friendship we had was a little bit hided, you know, with all the fight we had was really, you know, just uh, uh, we, we, in the last two weeks, we, we had a sort of, so uh, that's good, you know, that, but in, in, a, in a strange way also. The last thing uh, I remember in one life was um, there, of course, as a Ferrari driver, the Italians have a special way to celebrate you. And uh, when they, they announced my name, the Italians was jumping and, uh, and, and, and shouting. And I was just uh, in front of his car, and he was in the car, and he looked to me, and he, he was loving and, and things. So you, you really could see we was friends. It was a honest laugh. He, he was even happy if something went well for me. And that actually is the last the last time I really looked to his eyes and, and, and we just been, uh, uh, we, we seen each other. There have been many heavy accidents before. I had a very heavy accident in 89, I nearly died there. And uh, Ayrton, one day after Ayrton phoned me in the hospital, how I am, and I said to him, I'm okay, but uh, I, I think this corner, it's, it's very dangerous, and I think one day well, somebody's going to die there. It's, it's too dangerous and uh, should be doing something. But OK, we were talking a bit. And, uh, and then we went to testing to email a couple of months later. And there, I don't know myself, say, this corner should be changed. And uh, we walked to this corner. And um, we looked how it could be changed. And we looked over the, the wall. And there, don't says to me, but look, I cannot change this. There's a river behind. So there's no way to move the wall. And we look both and say, yeah, unfortunately, there's a river behind. We cannot move the wall, so let's, let's, that's, that's how it is. And, uh, and we walked back again. And it was exactly the point where he died. was the worst day in the history of Formula One because although many drivers were killed in Formula One before Ayrton Senna, none of them were as famous, none of them were respected and idolized worldwide like Senna was. And the impact of Senna's death on Formula One in particular, motor racing in general, and the world at large was like had never happened before, has never happened since, and I pray that it never does happen again. The Imola circuit witnessed the loss of one of the true greats of Formula One, but memories of Senna will never fade, and across the world, his spirit lives on. A ideia que eu tenho é que ele está muito próximo. Eu não sei como explicar. Eu sei apenas sentir. E a certeza de que ele está muito próximo, porque nós temos essa coisa com a morte, de que não devemos falar, não devemos pensar. A nossa civilização, ela renuncia à morte. Então, esses dez anos, 
parece que fica mais profundo, mais intenso, porque vão surgindo coisas no nosso inconsciente, esquecidas da sua meiguice, da sua forma de ser tão simples, que era a coisa que mais me marcou, era o jeito dele, humilde, simples. Uma vez o Ayrton disse que os ricos, as pessoas ricas, não podiam continuar vivendo é, numa ilha cercada por um mar de é, miséria, que todos nós respirávamos o mesmo ar. E a gente precisava dar uma oportunidade, ao menos uma oportunidade fundamental para as crianças e jovens. Então, essa é uma visão que o Ayrton tinha, é, que eu tenho, e nasceu da minha família, como é, uma educação, com uma educação de valores, que respeita a pessoa do outro e é, pensa que é importante é, que todos nós possamos ter oportunidades, é, dar certo, é, respeitar as pessoas e ser responsáveis, ser corresponsáveis pelo próprio país. Nesses dez anos de trabalho, nós estamos completando também dez anos esse ano, nós atendemos a 3 milhões 930 mil crianças e jovens em todo o país. Se eu fizer as coisas que eu fiz, é porque eu tive, primeiro de tudo, uma boa oportunidade na vida de crescer propriamente, de viver bem, de viver bem, de aprender muito. E eu fui levado, nos momentos certos, para a direção certa, eu acredito.